Hey, hey, what is happening, everybody? <laughs> Welcome back to Pianist Academy and uh, our, our, our next live stream, Q&A. This is awesome. We have a super, super awesome. I'm so excited for today's session. Um, there's some really cool things happening. Uh, let me know if you can hear me okay. Um, I'm kind of doing a whole bunch of new stuff with the computers and everything here. So uh, just let me know that it's all working and, uh, and we'll be good to go. And, and hopefully there aren't any problems. So we got a bunch of people in the house already. JG, awesome to see you. Sir Wolseley, great to see you too. Uh, Vasioth, great. Um, thanks for the, the comment on the gesture. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, let me answer that actually really quickly for you, this question. Uh, video two is either, a uh, gesture two for video two of the series is either gonna come out this weekend. I haven't edited it yet. I have finished shooting it. <laughs> uh, but I'm debating about whether it's gonna come out this weekend or next weekend. Um, so. Uh, stay tuned for one of those two times. Either I always release on Saturdays at um, 7 a.m. Mountain Time in the USA. Uh, speaking of that, it's 10 a.m. Mountain Time. I'm in Colorado Springs. It's great to see you. Let me know where you're coming from, especially if it's your first time here. Fazioli, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Good to see you, Fazioli88. Thanks for tuning in. I'm alive. Oh, Krakow, Poland. Awesome. Awesome. I have never been back to Poland, but... Um, a bunch of my, well, my dad's entire side of the family is from there. So uh, I'm looking forward to when I have the opportunity to come visit. Uh, and Jose, awesome. Good morning. JG, you're in Breckenridge in June. That's awesome. I'm actually going there on vacation in like five or six days. <laughs> so that's super cool. Oh, Fozzie Oli. In, oh, awesome. Just outside of Vail. <laughs> we should meet up sometime. <laughs> Okay, so, um, great, awesome, great to see everybody here. So, I have worked on, because last time I had a problem, I've worked on bringing back the top-down camera, and I think, let's just check out and make sure that that's working okay for everybody. Okay, so you should be able to see all of what's going on here. And hopefully it's synced okay with the audio. So let me know if it isn't. Uh, hopefully that's working. I'm, I'm so glad to have that back on track for us today. So just, yeah, drop it in the chat if it doesn't look good or something like that. Okay, so today's session is super, super special because um, we have started taking uh, videos, video requests, kind of, or, or masterclass video requests. So I've invited people to send in videos of themselves playing. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll do some reflecting on them live together and we'll actually watch the videos together. So this is gonna be just like um, if you went to a master class in person, usually those are open to the public and people get up and they play for their teacher or for the guest um, artist, guest teacher. 
Uh, everybody listens to the initial performance, and then we all listen together to what the teacher has to say. Um, so that's kind of what today's going to be like. And so I got two videos in this week, which I'm super excited to share. One is from Sir, Sir Wolseley, which we're going to go over first today. And JG, <laughs> JG, oh, that's a, that's a very sad looking face. <laughs> um, but hey, you know, we're, we're just going to take it one step at a time and, and reflect on exactly where we're at. So I appreciate it. JG, you sent in the other video. Thanks for both of those videos that got submitted um, <laughs> for this week. So I'm going to hit those two things first today. Uh, and then I'm going to go into, if we have any questions, I'll go back through the chat and, and look at what everybody submitted. So let's jump into this. Okay. I'm going to, Sir Wolseley, uh, you submitted yours a couple days ago. Um, so we're going to jump into that first. And you're playing um, Nocien, number one, by Eric Satie. So let me make sure that I got the video pulled up. Okay, Sir Wolseley, this is, this is your debut. <laughs> uh, so we're going to take a listen. We won't go through the whole thing. Thanks for sending the whole thing. It's like three, three and a half minutes, um, four minutes or so. Uh, so we're going to listen through maybe the first couple statements together, uh, and then I'll share with you my thoughts and ideas, and especially because you had some questions about the pedaling and things like that. So we'll talk about that. But first, let's dive into uh, listening to Sir Wolseley play Nyosin, number one. <laughs> So first off, Sir Wolseley, I think you mentioned in your email to me with this piece that you've only been playing for six months. I think that's what you said, around six months, like from the very beginning. Drop it in the chat. Is that, have you been playing piano total for six months? Yes, I agree with what JG said. Bravo. Especially that is, okay, six months. Yes. Like that's incredible progress. I just want to congratulate you, first of all, on that, because uh, it's, <laughs> it's, this is not by any means a beginner's piece of music, um, anything like that. So really, really wonderful job um, and good for you for tackling something that you probably really enjoy, first of all. That's why you picked this piece. Uh, and secondly, it's quite good. <laughs> so let's dive into a little bit more and, and talk about where we can take it from here. Um, so I know you mentioned a little bit about uh, the pedaling because we've been going back and forth in comments about um, where the pedal releases and where it comes back down and all that jazz. So uh, I do have a camera set up today so that you can hopefully uh, see what I'm doing with the pedal live. And let's just make sure that works. Okay, great. I'll make sure my hand stays out of the way. <laughs> okay. So first off, let's talk about the pedaling, yes. Um, you're doing a great job. You mentioned that you have started shifting to what I talked about with pedaling, which is releasing on the beat where we want the change instead of dropping the pedal on the beat where we want the change. So just from the top. Um, 
So the release is happening on the downbeat on F. And let me show you what that looks like down below. Okay. So first off, great job, because you've already made great strides toward putting it in that place. It still uh, looks and feels a little bit awkward, <laughs> and that's okay, because this is a huge shift. If you were pedaling where you lifted ahead of time and dropped the pedal on the downbeat, it's a huge mental shift just to move it those, I mean, half a second, less than a quarter of a second, milliseconds, really. It's a huge mental shift to make that happen. So. What I would encourage you to do to keep working on the pedaling is as you go through downbeat to down, well, depending on the score you have, I downloaded one that's got, that's divided into bars. The original piece, which we're going to talk about in a second, is not divided into any measures. But every time, let's say you have an F in the bass or the B flat in the bass, I think those are the only two changes we get. So anytime we have one of those, what I'd recommend that you focus on is that you hold the pedal down for the first bar, and then just focus on putting the lift up in the right place. So right there. And let me show you with the other camera. Uh, right here. <laughs> let me do it from the beginning. So if the pedal's down and then we lift, Just like that. You're pretty darn close to doing it like that already. So great, great job. Um, but just to solidify it that much more. Yeah, JG. <laughs> Sati, yeah, he's, he's a cool and crazy dude. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you're already doing a great job with, with getting it closer to that. But in order to solidify it more, I would just work on exactly where the lift happens. And then let the the, the uh, pushing down of the damper pedal start again slowly so that we're not going to be in a huge rush. We're in, we're in a rush. We want to lift precisely at that point and then precisely at that point. But then where the rest happens, uh, where, the, where the damper pedal comes back down, where the dampers go up, where we sustain, take a little bit more time and uh, explore the feeling a little bit more. So, so that we're focusing on the lift, not focusing on when the damper pedal comes back down. Then that's going to be aided by a second thing that I want to mention about your performance, which is that I think it's a little on the fast side, actually. Um, so it's marked Lent, which simply is slow. So if we take a little bit slower tempo, and it's not a, not a dramatic amount, just uh, maybe a few beats per minute, five beats per minute slower, something like that, we're going to give ourselves that much more time to work on this lift and s slowly putting the pedal back down for the downbeat. Because, yes, I'm alive. We're going to have a chance to ask, so, <laughs> yes, some questions. As soon as I finish these, the two videos that we're going to start today off with, for sure, yes. Um, so slowing down the tempo just a little bit is going to give us more time because the downbeat, we're going to need to hold our left hand down on this low F or the low B flat until the pedal comes back down. So if we slow the tempo down some, I can take a little bit more time and make sure that as the pedal is up and it has time to come back down, that I can, I have time to let the right hand I need to focus on keeping the right hand actually sustained and not just going and jumping to the next thing, right? Slowing down helps us, gives us time to let that shift in the hand happen, right? Okay, those are my comments about the pedaling first. Um, the second thing that I just want to bring up, and I'll make this quick. Um, Sati, like we've kind of already said, was an interesting person. <laughs> um, Nyo Sien is actually a made-up word, and in fact, uh, if you Google it, I think it says a piece of music with a dance-like quality, which um, it's not really a great definition. <laughs> um, 
Sati was was a very um, interesting person. He was a very spiritual person. I believe he actually founded his own religion. Um, I, we're not going to go into that in particular, but the derivative of the of Nocien is Gnosis, which is um, having a mystical or spiritual nature. So if we know that, that's what the, the set of pieces is called. They're really just mystic pieces of music, not really dance-like pieces of music. Um, and that can go a long way in helping us interpret exactly how slow the tempo marking is of Lent. It's very slow, right? And it gives us a lot of permission to be very blurry with the pedal. The type of tone we're looking for is something very ethereal, amorphous, not very tangible. So we don't want, I mean, it's, it's a different kind of tone than the other French Impressionists like WC and Ravel. We wouldn't pedal WC and Ravel the same way, you know, they wouldn't get the same pedal treatment each other. And Satie is even a little more different. And in a lot of his stuff, it could even be even a little more blurry just because of mostly what he was writing about um, is really f um, ambience, for the sake of ambience. Um, and really, really painting pictures of um, very simple yet very complex ideas. Just what it means to meditate is both simple and really complex. Um, and then if I quickly go through uh, I'm not sure what score you're reading off of, but there are a lot of, there's a lot of French um, directions throughout the piece. And I'm not a, I don't speak French. I never, uh, I have not studied French at all. So <laughs> I'm going to try to say what some of these words are. And forgive me if you do speak. Uh, I wish you could be on here also to help me out. <laughs> um, but right when we get to, uh, in my score, it's measure 10. Uh, but it's the first statement that goes into B-flat. Um, above that, where that statement starts, we have très luisant, Louis, luisant, I think that's it, très luisant, which I think literally translates to very shiny. Uh, and I think, okay, shiny sound or um, like a sparkly sound um, and I immediately, especially with the low bass, think of a bell ringing. And bells have a very bright, shiny type tone. So we can think about something, some of that. How can we differentiate, not just by dynamic alone, that this is piano. And then the next, the next new statement is, if we have that kind of um, uh, metaphor, or at least another picture in our mind of what the tone is about, bell-like quality, something like that, um, that's going to go really far toward guiding what forte actually means. Um, next, the next piece of text in the score, uh, questionne. Uh, I'm not sure if that's right at all, but it's literally translates to question, and it's this section that we heard right at the end of your playing. So that's super, uh, super interesting. So what can you do to make it more, to make it less, um, less of a statement, more of a question? We can add some rubato in the phrase. Um, It can have a little bit more push and pull than maybe we've had left before, especially compared with the previous phrase. If we think about bells ringing, that's usually going to be more metronomic and more predictable. Uh, so when we have this question, we can think about more rubato, less solidified rhythmically. Uh, and then moving on, we've got some more um, du bu, 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 de la Pense, du bout de la pensée, which trans, uh, literally translates the tip of the thought. And it's when we go back to the initial statement. 
I'm not exactly sure how I would interpret that other than it's just saying, literally telling you, well, this is the same material in case you missed it. Um, so let's go on from there. <laughs> We've got some more directions toward the end. We get this questioning bit that comes back toward the end of the piece. So it's the exact same material, but we have different text here. Uh, pas a pas, which is step by step, pas a pas, and postule en vue mama, which is literally apply on yourself which sounds very strange uh, in a musical context. <laughs> um, but what we can think about is, um, th maybe think about it this way, like applying yourself to every note. So instead of it having rubato, like the first time, where we can push and pull and do other things, if we're going to really focus on every note, it can be almost mechanical in nature. We still want it to have a shape, but very predictable. And that contrasts with what came before. Uh, and then at the very end of the piece, uh, sur la langue, la langue, on the tongue is what that means. Um, and we have a one final statement of what this the bell-like figure was. And I think of uh, on the tongue meaning like um, like the tip of your tongue when you have a thought that you can't um, you you have this idea of what you want to say and the words just you can't find them and you just you're trying really hard to think about it and you can't find them and they're lost in your mind somehow. Um, that's kind of what this feels like to me. It's, it's hesitant and it's like, we're musically conveying that, okay, there's, I kind of know what this is about, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Again, in contrast to. So then if we go back to the end, and it makes sense, it's the end of the piece, it's this way of, of tying a nice bow on things. How cloudy can we make it? <laughs> how, how, if we still have this vision of bells ringing, can we put a bunch of fog between us, what we're seeing, and the bells ringing? And then, like, just how much can we see through the fog? It's just a little bit. Um, so I hope all that helps, Sir Wolseley. <laughs> Thanks again. This is really, I give you a lot of kind of advanced things to think about, and I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, it's really, really a great accomplishment for only after six months to be playing this piece. So super, super congrats on that. And yeah, feel free to come back, watch the video to refresh some of this stuff. But we talked about the pedaling, and we can look at, you can look at some of that again. Oh, your hands. That was one more thing I wanted to talk about, actually. I've got the perfect shot, actually, where I paused the video. Let's, let's take a quick look at that. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> okay, so right here, uh, I don't know if I can talk and show you this at the same time, like draw a circle or something. So right here, we've got your left hand. And you see the shape that it's in. I'm going to come back to the piano. And so these knuckles, these are our, br our bridge. This is a point of a lot of strength, where we have a lot of strength and control in the hand. And your right hand doesn't do this as much. But I see the left hand, where we break the bridge, uh, something like that. I'm just trying to show you with one hand, or my right hand instead of my left. But this part is kind of collapsed. Uh, and we really want to work on making sure that that doesn't happen. This is another way. Your wrist isn't up as, as much as mine is here, but that kind of looks that way. So when this is happening, we're, um, we're pulling a lot in the bottom of the, the palm of the hand here because we're both pulling the fingers up in order to keep them from playing wrong notes, right? 
Uh, but then we have, then because this is collapsed, we're kind of like, everything is getting, the fingers are getting pulled up the tendons that go through the hands. That's what we feel in the bottom of the palm. Uh, but then, in order to keep the palm off the keys, we have some tension, extra tension in the wrist also. So what you should really focus on is, um, I normally when you're playing the left hand down low, the first note is just fine. It's when we come up and play some of these other chords that this is starting to go down like that. So what you can do is you can take your other hand and just, uh, just to keep a tiny bit of pressure under here to remind yourself this should stay uh, in, a, in a comfortable position, kind of like that. So we can put a little bit, just enough pressure here to keep your hand from going like that, just a little bit, and then try to play through that. And let your two hands work together so we're maintaining this shape. And then you can drop the right hand and see. I also would encourage you, you might, this might be really difficult to change, but um, you're playing fourth finger on all of the A flats, and you've got plenty big enough hands to do it. But you might find keeping the bridge intact easier if you play with five instead of four. And then, let's see, these, these spots. So let's say, especially focus on what's happening with the fifth finger. Because I feel like it's um, stemming from what the fifth finger is doing. And if the fifth finger, or the fourth finger, whatever the, the last finger on the left hand is, if we maintain good foundational structure there and use a little bit of your other hand to help especially under those knuckles I feel like the rest of the hand is going to follow it's when those hands kind of lead the way you can see that a little bit that then it starts to bleed into the other fingers so you'll also find that the more structure you have here in the bridge the less you're going to break up every time you play one of those chords sometimes the th three notes sound uh, at different times. And the more structure we have, the more they're going to sound all exactly at the same time. Um, so thanks for that reminder. <laughs> I did want to mention that and um, just take it slowly. That's a long, long process to build that kind of um, foundational structure in the hands. So just take it a little bit at a time. Don't Try to make it the only focus of what you work on in your entire practice session. Spend five or 10 minutes really making sure that you're, you're getting this right, using the other hand for a little bit of stability. And then keep working on other things. Keep working on the pedal, keep working on musicality, all the other things. Awesome. Thanks for the submission, Sir Wolseley. <laughs> this, was, this was really great. Um, awesome. So that covers Sati. Have you heard about the story of the 100 umbrellas in his apartment? <laughs> uh, you should, if you haven't, go Google that. <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting man, and kind of the, f the founder of uh, ambient minimalist kind of music um, that we have today. Um, so super interesting. We're gonna move on. There's one more video that got submitted. And then I'm gonna come back to ask some live questions. I'm not going to ask them. I hope you have them. <laughs> okay, so, JG. I've got your video pulled up here. Well, one of them. You, said, <laughs> you did send two. Oh, boy. Okay, so, JG, I picked the um, Chopin Nocturne. Um, it was really hard for me to kind of line up the, the YouTube where I don't get in. Uh, an ad from something or something, I don't know. Anyway, uh, if you want to send me that in a Dropbox or Google Drive, send that over uh, for next time for the list. But um, so Chopin, Nocturne, this is Opus 9, number one, and you were starting uh, somewhere toward the end of the first statement. So let's take a listen to that.
Nice. Nice, JG. Thanks for sending that. The Chopin Nocturnes are such, um, such beautiful pieces. Drop in the comment in the, in the chat, how long have you been working on this? Um, and how long have you been playing? Um, that'll help a little bit inform where I'm going to go uh, with this next bit. So before we get into the technical stuff, um, I've got you starting at the end of measure eight uh, here. Three to four weeks. Oh, wow, self-taught. You deserve another congratulations because this is, um, I would say, solidly intermediate level piece, late intermediate level piece. Um, I guess it depends on the, the grading scale you're looking at. Some would put it way, way, way out there, uh, and some would put it kind of in the middle. Um, so it definitely has aspects that are very challenging. So good for you. It's only been two years that you've been working at it, and you're completely self-taught. So awesome work. Uh, and you've been playing it for three to four weeks. How much more? Have you worked through the whole piece already, or have you stopped kind of before we get into um, the D flat? <laughs> That section. So let me know if you've worked on that yet, too. Um, I've never played this, so I'm sight reading for you. <laughs> so wish me luck. Okay, measure nine. The first thing I wanted to mention is in measure nine, we've got um, three staccato dots with a slur over them. Okay, well, that's, that's good, JG, if you've stopped right before the section. That's actually really good discipline. Uh, just to make sure that you're getting things right before you go on too far and you split up your practice time too much. So nice, nice job. Okay, measure nine. This is, um, maybe you know this already, maybe, you, maybe you're not sure, but when we have three dots, they look like staccatos, and then we have a slur over the top of them, that's called uh, portato. And portato is, um, hmm. It's not staccato, and it's not quite legato. It's legato connected by pedal, um, but it still has kind of a detached, slowly detached quality. So staccato with the pedal has one type of tone. Legato with the pedal has another type of tone. Thanks, Jan. <laughs> And then portato is going to be somewhere in between the two. So we can lift the hand uh, without that wrong note. Uh, and usually portato is placed um, in a phrase or in a bit where the composer wants a little bit more angst or there's more, uh, it's more, yeah, there's more anxiety in the, in the shape of the phrase. <laughs> yes. Legato with staccato. So this is, uh, the portato itself is a pretty advanced concept. So, because what we're listening for is a, a minute difference of tone, but it's also something that informs the shape of the phrase overall. Um, so when we look back at the very, very beginning of the piece, which you didn't play the very first bar, Those are just staccatos with a slur over the whole phrase. When the phrase comes back and repeats in measure nine, it's portato, so the staccato is with an extra slur. So we need to shape those in two different ways. Staccato with the pedal, we just get a different type of tone if we're releasing than if we stay engaged with the key. So portato is telling us, and it's aided a little bit by, there's a crescendo marked in my score. It's probably in yours too. Okay, so we can really think about it as more anxious, more angst, more, more rubato, less stable. The first phrase is very stable. It's the first time we're hearing it. The second statement, less stable. O 
Okay. So that takes us from measure 9 into measure 10. Measure 10 and 11, we get these um, quicker passages. Uh, so in measure 10, we've got a group of 11 across the second half of the bar. Like that. So with both this group and then the next group, that's all triplets in the next bar, I would encourage you to learn what it feels like to play it absolutely in tempo. That's really hard to put 11 against 6. So we're really shooting for just the first note of the group and then the downbeat of the next bar to line up. Something like that. So work on playing that as precisely as possible. Um, because sometimes we're going to want to do things and make shapes with these. Whoops. Maybe we want to make a shape, but we don't want the shape to be um, um, determined by our inability so far, because we haven't worked on it, uh, our inability to play the rhythm exactly how it's notated. So if we work on exactly what it is, and then we can mess with it and make it more musical, we're going to have a lot more options. And it's also, it's going to be less jagged. Because if we don't learn that first, we're going to end up lining up notes kind of in the middle. Kind of like that. Uh, and then we have things that kind of speed up and slow down and speed up and slow down. Um, and it's not going to be super apparent in just one, but if you end up doing that through all of these phrases that appear throughout this nocturne, all kinds of places, um, we're going to start to feel a little seasick. I love that phrase. It's something that <laughs> two of my teachers used to um, caution me of. Don't make the listener feel seasick where they cannot follow where the beats are. So in this nocturne... We just, even, it's in 6-4, but I'm not counting 6, I'm counting 1, 2. So here's measure 10. 1, whoops, 1, 2, 1. Okay, now I saw something. This is another thing. I'm not sure if you're doing the polyrhythms right. So the 11 against 6, yeah. That's a polyrhythm, and it's not going to be the simplest thing. Um, take right hand by itself first. Put on a metronome in here. One, two, one, where it's only the big clicks. Because if you subdivide into six, uh, it's going to be almost impossible, and it's going to totally take away the um, <laughs> your ability to make one line out of that if you're trying to do... So just forget about, and you can talk to any, any concert pianist. They're going to tell you, don't try to play 11 lining up with six eighths or lining up with three beats. It's going to be nearly impossible. And it's going to turn um, very, very mechanical, and it's still not going to be smooth. So work on hearing that one beat. This is very hard. But one beat for that entire span, one, one, like that. Okay. The next bar is actually much, much easier. And what you need to do is be sure that you don't get too anxious about this really cool statement. Uh, that. That's actually just all triplets. So. So tell me, JG, how are you with two against three? That's a much more common polyrhythm, if you even call it that. It's a much more common grouping of rhythms. Yeah, <laughs> a tactical rubato. I like that. <laughs> um, so tell me, JG, about the triplets, a two against three. Does that feel good? Can you play that okay? Ba da ka da 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 ka da. If we so two against three actually turns into this really cool combination rhythm. It's very close to this combination rhythm, which is ba 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 
uh, where I'm doing three. You can even practice this yourself. I'm doing three with the right hand, and I'm doing two with the left hand. But when you put them together, it makes one grid. Two against three isn't bad at all. So, um, yeah, you can even practice this to make it a little more solid. Ba, ba, ka, ba, 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 uh, and then we can put it together. Da, da, ka, da, da. Whoopsies. Da, da, ka, da, da. Okay. Because of the jumps. That's okay. That brings me to the next thing about measure 11. We can take a little bit of time to get from here from the, between the two Fs. But then as soon as, let's say, as soon as we get to the second group of triplets, we practice locking right into the tempo. So we can have a little bit of time and then lock in. And if you look, uh, if you go and listen to a lot of really fantastic concert pianists play this, you're going to hear that they actually don't do very much pushing and pulling. There's not a lot of rubato in measure 11. Um, they reserve that for other points in the piece, like measure three, which is the <laughs> 22 across the entire bar. Um, and actually, you know what? You might not have this, especially if you got your score online. I'm going to see. I think this will focus OK. And you can come back and pause the video. Um, but oh, this is tiny print. <laughs> well, I'm going to see if we can see this in the top down camera. <laughs> and, Maybe, maybe it'll be clear enough for you to look at this. Okay, so... <laughs> Let's see. So you can come back and pr uh, freeze frame that. I'm looking at especially... Um, there's a little note right at the top of the page called bar three, and it has, um, according to writings, what Chopin him, um, himself would have taught his students on the rhythm to play for 22 uh, throughout the bar, for 22 over six beats. And it shows the rubato that he liked. Um, so yeah, come back and freeze frame that. Um, the s uh, there was one more thing. Uh, Jose, this is, um, I believe it's Baron Ryder. Viner Urtext, W-I-E-N-E-R. Yeah, let me, let me type that in the chat. Uh, it has a lot of uh, uh, cool interpretive things in the, in the preface. Uh, let me see here. Um, so it's, it's an urtext, so it's kind of like, urtext means like uh, according to the original ma uh, manuscript or composer's autograph. Um, so you get some extra notes from the composer usually, or extra notes from writing and s writings and stuff like that about the piece of music. Uh, let's go back here. So, da -da -da -da. yeah, maybe it's, uh, JG, maybe it's because it's such a longer group that it's just, it feels like it flows more naturally and we don't have to line it up in, in shorter segments. Yeah, you know, IMSLP is great. It really is great. Uh, and it makes a lot of this stuff. The, the <laughs> print editions are incredibly expensive, and they still are. And even if you go like um, Henley these days, Henley is another really famous publisher. Uh, Henley has a lot of Urtext editions that have a, t a tremendous amount of notes. I usually only use them for Beethoven and Bach. Um, I don't always trust what the editions have to say or the fingerings in them for Romantic Era and beyond, but they're another Urtext. So um, they have digital editions that they offer now for download, but they're almost the same price as the print. Um, and so getting a, a set of Nocturnes is still going to cost you like $25 when uh, on IMSLP it's free. So I totally understand that. Um, and gosh, all of my Urtexts were bought when I was studying. Uh, and since then, so over, I don't know, 20 years of studying, um, I bought all paper copies or print copies.
And since then, uh, I just use IMSLP, and if I need some extra information, I either pull out one of these about the composer that I have, or I just look up some things online. I look, I Google, you know, Nocturne Opus 9 number one, uh, and find out any information I can. And you're likely going to be able to find out a lot of stuff that's in this book. It just is going to take you a little more time. Um, I wanted to talk quickly about measure 11 again. And actually, let me pull your video back up. <laughs> I, I hope people that had questions have stuck around. This has been great, though. A lot of fun. Okay, so I'm pulling your video back up. And we're going to take one more look. And I want you to uh, look at what your right hand does, especially in measure 11 when we get there. This is going to start a little bit in the middle. Okay, so there are a couple things I want to quickly address there. Uh, first off, the jump is fine. You've got more time than you think. Hey, Sammy Brev, good to see you. Okay, so you've got more time, JG, than you think to get from beat one to beat two. You don't have to be in a rush. Okay, so that's number one. Second thing, we have got all these crosses to the fourth finger, and I think you're using the right fingering. There's our first one, from C to B flat. And let me show you my overhead cam. OK, let's see. So here's the first one. Hopefully, it's, uh, it's not too delayed for you. Looks a little delayed on my screen, so sorry about that. Um, but we're going to just look at from the C over to B flat. And when I see you do this on your video, there's a really large motion out with the elbow. And that kind of thing happens. And if I show you what that looks like on my other camera, we have this, and the elbow kind of comes out, and it sticks out. We make this really big motion. And we want to try to get rid of that, especially because this is a little bit faster passage. So focus on keeping your thumb here on C, and just cross the fourth finger over. We don't need to do anything crazy. The arm doesn't need to go like this to be able to reach. We can still reach just fine. And then here again, fourth finger, I saw the same kind of thing happen. Mm, let's see. Here it comes. So here, on four, um, don't, don't swing it out like that. All right. Uh, and so that was one thing. Keep the fourth. I just do an easy cross, and if you need to, do some leaning to the right. The left hand can easily play all of this. So I can go here and lean, and when I lean to the right to allow my body to be more centered on what the right hand is doing, it still gives the left hand, there's plenty of space for the left hand to work, it's fine. but. Let's see, let me come back and actually sit where I would be if I was playing this, which is way down here. So if I lean, my head moves from being centered over uh, middle C or a little left of middle C to being centered an octave-ish higher. So as soon as I lean that far, now I don't have to do this th weird thing. Because if I sit all the way kind of where I'm supposed to, right, for the rest of the rep or the rest of what I'm, the piece is calling for, it's going to be hard to get that without doing this awkward turn, right? All right. So, awesome. Cool. I'm glad that's helpful. Last, last thing, and I know this is going to apply to a lot more in the piece and in other stuff that you're working on. Let's see, when you were coming down in this same bar, and this is going to happen in more places, but... It was either... It was one of the times the second finger played, and it wasn't on a black note. It may have been right here on the last C, but I saw your last knuckle here 
bend kind of backwards a lot, where instead of keeping a, a curved shape, it went and it got bent backwards as you played. Uh, it's kind of hard to show that, but I think you know what I mean. Uh, and we want to make sure that's not happening in any of the fingers. It's a little tough to see on the top-down view only. Uh, but even on that cross, anytime the second finger's playing, keep that nice curved shape. Um, I always suggest that you not work on that kind of thing in repertoire because we want to be thinking about other things. So play a B flat minor scale, focus on what the second finger's doing. Right? Make sure that it's not collapsing anywhere throughout the scale. And do the same thing with the left hand, too. Um, cool. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's super important. Uh, yeah, just chiming in with what Sir Wolseley is saying. Um, this was really awesome. We're not done for the day yet. Uh, I do want to go. There's a, oh, man, there's a whole lot of chat that I have to go through really quickly, as quickly as I can. <laughs> Uh, JG, yeah, when you don't pay attention. So pay attention to that when you're going through your technical warm-ups, your scales, your arpeggios, and things like that. Or if you use Hannon or whatever you use as warm-ups, take those, those moments to focus on what the tips of the fingers are doing and to focus on other technical things. Uh, and then try to let it go when you're working on the music because you've got enough to think about. Even in that bar already, you have to line up three against two perfectly for the bar. That's not going to leave a lot of brain space to think about what the tips of your fingers are doing, right? So just one thing at a time is great. Um, so we're not done yet. I do want to go back through the chat. Uh, the trill, like in measure 13. <laughs> yeah, I think you've got the trill right. Um, I will leave you a comment when I listen again if it's not, but I'm pretty sure um, I, no bells went off in my head <laughs> that there was an issue there. So, yes. Yeah. Great. Great stuff. Um, so, if you want to be a part of this in the future, and uh, maybe I'll kind of dedicate um, some Q&A time to... Uh, or s one, some of these live streams to doing master classes only and maybe some to just uh, answering questions. Um, because I feel a little bad that I've gone 50 minutes on these two pieces <laughs> and I haven't gotten anybody else's questions. Um, but I think there's a whole lot that everybody could have learned from what we talked about. So um, let's see. Is Fazioli, are you still here? <laughs> I haven't seen you in the chat, and I think you had a question earlier on. So, just let me know. They were looking for some virtual uh, piano lesson tips, like technology tips. So, I'll come back. Oh, yay! You're still here! Woo! <laughs> okay, so Fazioli. Challenges with virtual lessons. Um, let me see. Are you coming at this as a teacher or as a student? Because I know I have both kinds of um, people uh, here in the chat today. OK, as a student, great. So I teach lessons online, and I like to use Zoom. Um, what's really important is that if you have a computer, a laptop, that you use a laptop uh, and not an iPad or a phone, if possible. There are more sound options on the computer than on another device. And in Zoom, it's really important to make sure that there's something called original sound. And there, I take my students through the um, checklist of all the things that need to be checked. And most of the time, then, the audio that comes through the computer itself is pretty good. If the all boxes, the right set of boxes, are checked. If they're not checked, it's all sorts of messed up and because Zoom tries to mute anything that's not a human voice. So it makes it really hard to teach <laughs> if the things aren't set up. Almost impossible, actually. Now, as a step up from that, um, you can also look into getting like a USB mic. Uh, something like that that can attach to the computer. It doesn't have to be at a crazy amount of money. It could be... There are some USB mics out there that are like 30 bucks, 50 bucks that do a pretty darn good job. And if you really want to get into something that'll serve you really well, 
Um, there's ones like the um, Blue Yeti is a very, very popular one. And I think it's around 120 or 100, yeah, 100, 120 dollars, something like that. Uh, and that's a really great microphone. I have a student that uses it. Sounds really nice. We get all the check boxes set up and it's as good as it's as, as, as close to being in the room with them as it's possible right now with technology the way it, the way it is. Um, and we can talk about a whole lot of stuff. We can have very advanced lessons doing that kind of thing. Uh, and camera setup. So um, what's really important for the teacher is going to be seeing a side angle, kind of like this angle that I'm showing you right now, because there's so much that we can see about the technique and what you're doing with your body and the shape of the hands and everything. And once in a while, we might need to shift something around to say like, okay, can I need to see the left hand better. Um, but that's going to be the most important thing. Side view, uh, not too much height, because I want, as a teacher, I want to see what the elbow looks like, what the shoulder looks like. And the more top down we are, the less I can see if this kind of thing is happening. And weird things like this, like we just talked about, it's really hard to see. I have to look in other areas for um, uh, like triggers or, or giveaways that something else in the body isn't working right. <laughs> Richard, as a loyalty to Skype, I haven't used Skype in like five years. <laughs> um, so the other cool thing about Zoom is that, and maybe this is possible, Skype, Richard, chime in if, if it's possible, but... Um, you can have an account and have multiple devices and sign in with multiple camera angles. And I actually have a student that does that too, um, that has like a, one to talk with me face to face and another that's on the keys. And then one of those, the one that runs the sound can be your computer and the other one could be a phone or an iP iPad or whatever mobile device that you have. You can download the Zoom app and log in uh, and you can just join the meeting. And we can have multiple camera angles and you don't have to have all the fancy stuff I have to show you what I do <laughs> on these live streams because that's just not a thing. <laughs> that's not a thing for pretty much any piano students. Um, so I hope that answers your question um, from a student perspective, uh, what's really important and things like that. Um, yeah, so you don't need to get a microphone right away if you can set up the computer audio and it's probably it's probably good enough even at the distance it needs to be uh, it's probably good enough to start with yeah jg yeah blue blue yeti <laughs> okay let me go back through um thanks for that question fazioli and by the way great screen name <laughs> have you ever fazioli have you ever gotten to play a fazioli a fazioli I've gotten to play a couple. Let us know. They're pretty cool pianos. Um, all right. So I'm just going through and checking out as people were commenting. Huh, da, 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 da. This is great. I'm, gl I'm super happy you guys uh, chat back and forth. You guys and you girls. I, <laughs> hey, miscellaneous. Good to see you again. <laughs> oh, Cyrus and Aurelius. I, yeah, I'm going to chime in on this. You said, one of the most harmful comments I've heard is that youngsters are too young for Chopin. Yeah. I don't think anybody is too young. There are things, sure, there are things that age is going to, you know, help inform our musical decisions. Uh, and... I think you can see that, especially, um, I don't know how many of you, maybe Cyrus and Aurelius, you're, you have been to or seen some of like the youth piano competitions and things like that. There are some tremendously amazing pianists that are very, very young. And usually the only thing that they're, that they're lacking, if they're like eight, nine, ten years old, they're playing incredible music. They just don't have the emotional experience to draw on to really interpret something in a in a super thoughtful way. That said, they can play some really amazing music. So, yeah, I usually if I'm working with very young students, um, I just their technical level informs what we're going to work on, and we can talk about a whole lot of you know other things throughout lessons. But 
I totally agree. There is, uh, there is no age that's too young, really, for much of any music, except if you can't reach it, that's going to be bad. If the stretches are too big, we don't want to hurt the hand. We don't want to cause injury. Um, but if the technique is there, you know, <laughs> even if you have small hands, there are ways of playing this, even though it spans a huge amount of real estate on the keyboard, we can play that with very small hands, hands that are span less than an octave. So totally. Mm. I'm just reading through the rest of your comments, Cyrus, and it really is. <laughs> Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. <laughs> Maybe if you could chime in again, um, when you say that, um, difficulty, that was the teacher that said difficulty isn't our problem, is it? Courtney, difficulty. Chime in with that uh, on that again, because I'm not exactly sure what you mean. Um, which which side was she on the side of like playing anything according like difficulty doesn't matter or that technique wasn't going to be worked on because <laughs> those are very different things. <laughs> Iris, oh yeah, you lost your self-taught status, JG. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's cool. I think, I mean, okay, you're not seeing a teacher every day <laughs> or every week. Maybe every two weeks if you continue to submit, right? <laughs> um, awesome. I'm just about down all the way to the bottom of the chat again. I'm alive. I see your question. Um, so you have a question about Chopin's five-finger position. Byron Janis once said that Chopin was against left and right wrist movement. Ah, oh. hmm. So, I don't know if I can comment on left and right wrist movement like this, and if I show you from top, like this, to the right and to the left, like this. Um, we can't do too much of it because too much is going gonna, is gonna to be a little um, messy for our technique. Chopin was a huge proponent of wrist rotation. And so there is left-right movement. And in a sense, we also do need to be moving in and out of the keys. And his music just works so much better if uh, if we're practicing it and, and learning it and with those kinds of techniques in mind. So I'll have to look up that comment from uh, Byron because technically the school of thought that established that kind of motion wasn't, uh, wasn't around yet. It, didn't, it wasn't around for almost another 100 years. Um, and also we know that Chopin played instruments that had far less weight in the keys, like half or less weight in the keys. And I mean, as you go back and back further in time, the keys were lighter and lighter and lighter. So, and the instrument also sustained less and less and less. So the way we have to play Chopin today is different than how, you'd, how Chopin played it on his own pianos. The pianos weren't as large, they didn't sustain as long. The keys took far less effort to depress and make a sound come out. And like Sir Wolseley said, the keys were also smaller. They were narrower. The whole keyboard wasn't as long. And there is a movement right now to bring back a shorter keyboard, and which will help people, especially those with smaller hands, be able to play octaves more easily, be able to play even music that might be completely inaccessible, like Rachmaninoff that uses all those tenths with notes in the middle, anything like that. Um, so... I do think that some of the technique that we have to apply to today's instrument needs to change a little bit from what was um, kind of preached at the time. Oh, thanks for the super, uh, super chat, Jan. Thank you. 
Um, awesome. So, yeah, for those reasons, we have to change the technique a little bit, but there's still things that we can learn from Chopin. So you mentioned about the five-finger position. And the five-finger position that I know about that Chopin taught was uh, the second half of the E major scale, or second half of the B major scale, starting on E and going up the black keys. Uh, I think, yeah. So just that. Sounds kind of like that if you if you link it as an E. I believe that's E. Is it Lydian? Do we have any jazz people in here? <laughs> hey, Massimo. I haven't seen you in a long time. Good to see you. Um, so the whole purpose behind starting with the five finger position is to allow the hand to sit naturally in the correct place uh, the, uh, on the keys, where we're not over curled. Sometimes, especially as adult pianists here, which I think most of us are, if we play in a C position, which is how most method books start, and we don't allow the hand to, we don't allow the fingers to go between the black keys, we can end up pulling the fingers back too much. Now, smaller kids don't have that problem. Okay, their hands are shorter to begin with, the fingers are shorter to begin with, they're not as likely to be playing in between the keys. But I see a tremendous amount of adult students who start with method books not know how to get actually out of the key because I think they've been stuck in a position that's not healthy. And as soon as we move to E, we can see that all of our fingers are playing on the edges of the keys. We don't have to move anything. We don't have to move anything in or out of the piano to make that happen. It's all in one place. And we gain a, a great, great uh, feeling of how, you know, what that's supposed to feel like. And then we can start incorporating other things. Um, there is also, um, I should point out, Chopin never took beginner pianists. He, um, he always took people that already knew how to read and could already play uh, quite a bit of music. So the literature usually says intermediate level and beyond were the students that he taught. But he would pull them all the way back down to just playing in a five-finger position and kind of start things over again. Um, so let me go back to your question. So if we apply that idea, the five-finger position, and we apply that to other scales, let's go to C because C is the hardest one. <laughs> it's the hardest one to play musically, and it's the hardest one for the hand to navigate. Um, I'm not doing any um, wrist movement playing it at a normal speed. Um, let me show you from the top down. So I'm sitting a little bit further to the right because of the microphone and looking at everybody. So don't mind that. Whoops. So if I was doing motion led by the wrist, I might be doing that. And we don't want to do that. That's a lot of excess motion. Right? But what we can do as we practice, as we practice scales, uh, and I actually did a video on this. If you're looking to build speed, you practice across the finger cross, the thumb cross. And in cases like these, I do a little bit, just a little bit of leading with the wrist. And I mean, it's almost impossible to see. So it's more of a feeling of letting the wrist move a little bit, but I would say in actual like space around the piano, it's not moving horizontally more than mm, half an inch, something like that. So it's more, it's more a mental game to, to trick our body into doing something even better, <laughs> even quicker and even better than it already is. So chime in, um, I'm alive, chime in and, and let me know if that was uh, helpful for you. Um, and yeah, I'll come back if, if we need to have a little bit more discussion, I'll come back to that. Oh, okay, okay. 
Oh, thanks, Cyrus and Aurelius. There's a quote from a book. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Having students choose they, so Cyrus and Aurelius. Uh, we're going back to um, what we were talking about earlier with um, not letting difficulty get in the way of choosing rep for a student. Um. <laughs> yeah, these are great comments. Um, cool, cool. Let me see. Four score, Fazioli, what sheet music apps do you use? Yeah, I use four score for sure. Just like Iris said, uh, four score industry standard from all her research. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. A couple episodes ago, I think you asked me, didn't you, Iris? Uh, about um, sheet music app. But four score is what I use. It's got tremendous capabilities. Uh, I mean, I use it on a daily basis, so it's well worth, I think it's $20 now for the app, but it's well worth it. I even use it for other types of PDF annotation that I do on my iPad. Um, it's just the best app if I need to go in and do anything, whether it's music, marking up a score, signing documents, drawing something for a student, drawing something out. Um, it's a super easy way to have like a pen and paper app that I can easily compress into a PDF and do anything with it. Plus it works, it syncs great with a Bluetooth pedal as well. JG, there is nothing wrong with using paper only. You can, I mean, that's why <laughs> it's, I've actually been really enjoying using paper. I used my iPad exclusively for actually a long time to do all my note reading and stuff. And I've been pulling out, I've even got scores here on the other side of the piano. I've been pulling out and doing more and more reading off paper if I've got a paper copy, um, especially because I spend the whole rest of the day on the computer. Usually it's a really nice break to just have um, paper to look at and not another screen. Yeah, JG, you want slightly wider keys so your hands can... <laughs> yes, yeah, an octave. Wouldn't that be great if we didn't have to stretch for an octave? You know, I bet... Composers, new composers would start writing just things that were even crazier, things that weren't possible before. So, you know, writing things that are twelfths to be played in one hand because there are still people that have large hands. <laughs> um, let me hit this, this question. So let's wrap up, let's say in like five to ten minutes or so. There's a question from Recover. So, hey, it's good to see you. Um, I haven't seen you before, I don't think. So welcome. Do arpeggios need to be played finger legato? Their answer is twofold, yes and no. <laughs> if you can let me know what level you're at, I can answer that even a little bit better, but I'm gonna do a little bit more demonstration. Okay, anytime we have uh, a group of notes that spans a distance that we can reach, let's say we can reach comfortably, um, we can always benefit from practicing in two different ways. So yes, finger legato, if I take B major, because I'm tired of playing things in C, I can play B major and finger legato the cross. Now, building a faster speed with that is going to be nearly impossible because, like something that we just talked about, the more finger legato we need to do over a span like that, the more wrist we need to, the more turn we need to have in the wrist, uh, the more movement we have in the arm. So this is actually another interesting point that I should have brought up about the wrist um, movement stuff. But actually, um, movement in the hand almost always starts from, oh, healthy movement in the hand almost always starts from further up the mechanism. So if I want to turn the hand, I don't actually turn it from the wrist down here because we can't really do that effectively. I turn it by moving the elbow. So there are some times that we want to do a little bit of a turn. And an arpeggio, okay, we can do some finger legato, but we kind of have to throw the elbow out. And that is something that I just suggested that JG not do. Because this is excess motion, right? So finger legato is great for arpeggios at slower tempos. And as long as we can reach it without doing too much of the, the chicken, chicken wing kind of thing. <laughs> okay, there's C, 
D. Now, when we get into is that um, the faster we need something to go, the less time we have for motion and the more streamlined everything needs to be. That means playing finger legato at a fast tempo is going to be... I can't even do finger legato at a fast tempo. Because in order to do it, it's super awkward, right? And it's causing my thumb to actually accent like that because I end up, there's so much elbow movement that I end up dropping on it as my elbow comes back. And sure, that could be trained out a little bit. But what we're going to find is that we need to separate and stop practicing finger legato at a certain tempo and shift to um, it's still going to sound legato because eh, it's a little detached but it's close to legato and if as soon as we put the pedal down like we'd put down like we'd use in a piece of repertoire it'll be fine um, so we switch from connecting across the cross thumb cross like that to actually letting the hand come off the key and then fall on the next note where I'm keeping the elbow from doing the chicken dance so it's not going out like we have to to do the finger cross and our goal when we start to incorporate this kind of practice our goal is to play the same dynamic and the same articulation for the third finger and the finger that crosses the thumb. Whoops. Thanks. Thanks, Recover. I'm glad this is, I'm glad this is helpful. So let me show you also on the top down because that'll be even more informative. I think, oh, it's a little bit delayed. Well, let's see. Bear with me. Um, so, from this camera angle, so from here, that's really delayed, <laughs> but hopefully you're seeing kind of that motion. All right, and then as we speed that up and put the pedal down, Um, and then depending on if it's just arpeggios alone, you can work on it that way. Uh, and you can practice both. Practice finger legato, slow speeds. As you speed up, start to move to this skipping. But make sure that we're not accenting anything because that's going to cause uh, other problems in our repertoire if we end up accenting the middle of the arpeggio. Oh, cool, cool. Hey, Jackie's here. Hey. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Sir, Sir Wolseley, do you think it's good to do warm-ups before you start playing? So, awesome. This will be the last question for today. Um, yes. <laughs> Short answer, yes. Um, Even in, now, the, the level that you're playing at, that might change a little bit. But I think you'll see that a lot of people still warm up with something. A warm up um, in your first year of playing, your first five years of playing, m should probably be scales, arpeggios, other things, other technical things. Um, anything, anything like that. Uh, if you're working on um, an etude of sorts, um, so at your level would be like the Bergmuller etudes um, or some of the easier charity etudes those could also be warm-ups they're gonna have a little bit more musicality in them but they should still be you should still warm up yes now you might get further and further and further along and your warm-up might turn into um, like recover just mentioned Chopin opus 10 number one um, I haven't played that in a long time Very rusty. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that could be something that you warm up with 
after you've played a piece like that. That might turn into your warm-up instead of doing scales and arpeggios. And it's a big piece of music. That one in particular doesn't really work the left hand at all, so you'd probably want to do something else that works, <laughs> works something with the left hand. Um, so I guess that's my, my best answer for you. Yes, until you're like really, really well established in the repertoire, use technical exercises to warm up. Use scales, arpeggios, Hannon, <laughs> or um, Cherny etudes, Bergmuller etudes, anything that's uh, an easier type etude, yes. Uh, use those and make the, make the goal to warm up. Um, there is something, and I, I think this is true, um, there is something to be said for getting the blood flowing to the right places. Now, doing that, how long that's going to take you is going to depend on your body and, and how much you've played and other things that you've done throughout the day. And there are some professionals that say that they don't need to warm up at all. They can just sit down and, and play stuff. And I have seen many other professionals that try to sit down and play something after not warming up, and it's, um, it's, it's rusty. <laughs> it might be pretty good, but it's still missing the clarity and missing other things that after their first five minutes, it, they, it all vanishes. So no matter what level you are, there's always value in doing something like that, for sure. Yes. Let me see. JG said something here. Uh, once you play for longer, 15 minutes of technical exercises won't tire you out. Yeah, that's true. There's actually a lot of... Um, I, don't, I don't remember who said this, but I really like it. And it stuck with me. That pianists are like... We're like Olympians of the small muscles. Uh, if you think about it that way, we have to do a lot, a lot of stuff with muscles that like never get worked out, that p a lot of people don't even know exist in the body. Uh, <laughs> we're not really aware that they're there. And when we sit down at the piano and we start doing things, we start working these muscle groups that don't get worked in any other part of our daily life. Um, and so it's very true that um, like any other kind of exercise that you do, you have to build up to being able to go for longer and longer periods of time. And like any other exercise, if you're going to go running, you're not going to just like bolt out the front door. You're going to stretch first. And stretching is the warm up to get things kind of working. Playing the piano is really the same way. And we can, we can build in endurance at the piano as well. Despite the fingers themselves not having muscles, we don't use the fingers themselves when we play by themselves. They are the end of the mechanism. They're what contacts the key. But so much of what pl uh, of playing happens in other parts of the body that this, I mean, you should be able to do this. There are people that tap on, on tables. You know, you should be able to do that all day because that's very easy. But when we have to put more force through it, then we're using muscles that are further away. We're using other groups of muscles. Um, and those need to get exercise, they need to build endurance, they need to get stronger, right? And we don't want to injure something by trying to make it do something before it's ready. So yes, warm-ups. Mark andre Omlin says he just warms up through his pieces. <laughs> yes, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> uh, we can't all be Mark andre Omlin. <laughs> but he's a uh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful pianist. Um, awesome. Um, let's, uh, yeah, miscellaneous, you warm up with the Bergmuller etudes. Yeah, those are nice. And they kind of trade nice, nicely back and forth between the two hands. A lot of them do. So you get a little bit of exercise of both hands. It's not just dedicated to one only. Awesome. Okay, we're going to call it a day today. Uh, thanks so much. There's a lot of people that have stuck around the whole time. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for joining us. Fazioli, thanks for being here. Thanks for your question. I hope you'll tune in again. And remember that, okay, anybody can participate in sending videos for the streams. Anybody can send anything in. It doesn't matter what level it is. I will take a look at it. It could be, uh, you know, level two, RCM. It could be level 10 or beyond. I, I don't care. We will look at it and tackle it together because we're all on the journey together. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of ways that we could benefit from even beginner stuff and advanced stuff simultaneously. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for being here. Be sure you can drop me those videos in an email. 
uh, drop, don't, don't send me an email. Drop them in a Google Drive or Dropbox and send me a link in an email. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll pull them up and we'll feature them on a stream sometime in the future. Awesome. Well, thank you again for being here. And um, <laughs> yes, so JG, two weeks, two weeks. So thanks for being here. Uh, come back and see us again. It's always a great time and I uh, love seeing everybody that I'm getting to know here in the chat. It's always great to see all of you. So thanks for being here. Uh, practice smarter. <laughs> oh, Cyrus. Oh, I'm, I'll look that up. Which ending do I like for <laughs> Mozart? I will, I will look that up for you, Cyrus and Aurelius. <laughs> All right. So until next time, have fun, you guys. Keep practicing hard. Enjoy music. And uh, I'll see you uh, next time.